You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Write Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, have you ever read anything that made you think differently about fiction? And today to answer, we have on Bridget Canning, author of the greatest hits of Wanda James and editor of What's Written in the Ladies. Fiction in general. Um... I would say probably The Colony of Unrequited Dreams uh, made me think differently about, um, and, and Wayne Johnson's, his other book, uh, First, First Snow, Last Light, because um, he's able, you know, he's able to, he's taking these real life characters and creating a fictional story around them. So kind of like the blurring of those kinds of lines. And uh, he was up for the Winterset Award with me, so he was talking about this uh, at the Winterset Festival, and he was talking about like how angry he made people when he wrote *The Colony of Unrequited Dreams* by you know taking taking liberties with Joey Smollett and putting him in and you know ma- making this uh, you know this this, this real life person and creating a different story with that, uh, which I I mean I absolutely loved it. Me too. Um, so, but I, but I remember like the uh, the. That, that definitely did make me think about well you know how is how is what what is the real story of him i mean joey smallwood is this, this figure who's you know beloved and reviled so much in this province uh it makes sense that you would write an epic novel about him where he is completely different yeah um um so like the the i guess so yeah the, 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 i remember when i was reading that and thinking about fiction and just the the possibilities of it being kind of endless that way and um how you know just basically not to have too much of, not, not, to, to, to just kind of yeah i remember kind of like it kind of cracked something open <laughs> when, yeah. I, when i read that book about how um like everything everything is what 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 is nonfiction? What is you know what is everything in a way is fiction? I love that book. I, I love all his work. Have you read? Uh, I think possibly my favorite book ever is uh, by him, the the Divine Ryan's. Have you read that? Oh my god, the Divine Ryan's is my favorite book in my early twenties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely loved it. Yeah. Yeah, so much going on there. Like every page is yeah. just packed. If I if I write anything in my life that is a tenth of that, I will consider myself successful. <laughs> yeah, like when the the Protestant family when they call each other when their hockey teams win. Oh my yes. god, I remember dying over that. It's yeah. So great. Yeah. I had actually just, I'd read it in university in, in Mun, and I had, at the same time, I was taking a Greek history course, and I just read the Odyssey, and so... Uh-huh. He uses a lot of the Odyssey, like it's a, it's allegorically in his in that book. So it's like I was reading them both in tandem and just geeking out over it. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Laura Lana Dunn, the superstar short story author who recently put out her first full novel, Ashes, which came out in June 2020 from Engine Books. Uh, Laura Lana Dunn, have you ever read anything that made you think differently about? Fiction as a concept, in the sense of plot lines, things that can be done with stories, characters. Yeah, all that. Or not? Oh, you're gonna do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For me, uh, for example, so so that, so mine is Life of Pi, um, because it was a fiction novel that kind of altered my opinion of real life. Um. Which is interesting. Like I, I kind of went into it with, uh, it's it's predicated in the prologue as being like this is a story that'll make you believe in God, and it didn't do that. But it kind of changed my opinion on my lack of belief, which is interesting. Like when fiction can change your real world outside of the novel point of view on something, that's powerful fiction, you know. Yes, I'm going to say yes. So there's this one book, and it, this might be a weird answer because I've actually never been able to finish the book. Interesting, okay. Yeah, I have attempted several times, 
and it is called House of Leaves. I thought you were going to say Lord of the Rings. Uh, I've never read that. Okay. No. No. House of um, Leaves, though. House of Leaves. I'm going to slaughter his last name. I believe he's Polish, so it's by Mark Z. Daniel Wuski. Okay. Daniel and it is a book in a book in a book. So the concept of the story is that a family moves into a house that is bigger on the inside than on the outside, which is interesting because when I first started reading this book, I had never watched Doctor Who. So it was it was a, a newer it was a new concept to me at the time, where you know it was a, a spatial kind of thing. Um, so that's part of it. That's one of the storylines. It's that, and that storyline, if I'm remembering correctly, is actually kind of horror because there's something living inside of the house in a dimension that only exists in the house. Okay. So that's the start of that one. Um, other than that, and all of the story, all of the books tie into each other. So someone, the father, I'll call him, who moves into the house of, with the, his family is making a documentary on the house. Someone has written, what was it? It was almost like an analysis on the documentary. And those, the papers, the report exists in another timeline. But the person who had them passed away, which happens in the very beginning of the book. So, I mean, that's not a spoiler at all. Uh, and then someone else finds them. And as he goes through reading all of these manuscripts and the way that the documentary is described weird things start happening in, in his portion of his life. And between that, if you're going through the pages, if you're switching between them, once you start progressing into the book, they start bleeding into each other in the sense that you'll be reading one and then the very next page or paragraph, you'll be in the other part of the story. There's no real chapter break. There's no setup. There's nothing like that. And the, the author and I guess the publishing company introduced... I'm going to say almost like clippings of the actual manuscripts that are stuck in there. And somewhere there's somewhere rumored on the internet that some of the pages have black light ink. Like it's, it's craziness. Okay. Um, so it's, it's an endeavor. Again, I've started three or four times to finish this book and I have been unable to just because of the way it weaves back and forth, but it, it kind of expanded the way that I was looking at storylines, I think, and seeing, how even though they're completely disconnected in all of these spots, they're very disjointed, but they can still overlap and kind of bounce off of one another to veer someone in a certain direction. And I thought that was really interesting. And the storylines themselves, the way they're, they're written, are very interesting. Like, he's a, he's a good writer. So getting it translated to English, I think, um, at least I hope nothing was kind of lost in the translation there. Okay. Yeah. That's That's... Really cool. I've got to check out that book now. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Ellen Curtis, who serves on the Wannell board and is the author of the Infinity series from Engine Books, as well as the editor of the From the Rock anthology. Have you ever read anything that makes you think differently about the process of writing fiction? Yes. A Prayer for Owen Meany. Really? Completely changed the way I thought about setting up stories because there were so many, there were so many layers to that story that at first glance seemed like you're just telling the story of two friends growing up and it's a story that spans... 30 like, years? Uh, I think it's 20. Okay. Um, so, but it's a story that spans decades, and so there's a lot of information there, and you don't think that everything could possibly tie in, but the magic in it is that it does, and that everything has meaning, and the way that things have meaning kind of points to something else, and I just, I loved it. Actually, it's an interesting, I find that, like, I wonder if Signs, the M. Night Shyamalan movie, was in any way inspired by A Prayer for Own Meaning, because it's the same payoff. It's the same, is it was it? all leading to one thing. Is it though? I, it is. Hmm. And I think I, Science did it better. I, I argue that Prayer for Omini no. is sometimes pretentious. No. I do. No. I think you're thinking of the movie adaptation. I, I am a bit. Horrible. Yeah, the movie. What was the movie called again? I can't even remember. I tried to block it out of my mind. As but it wasn't possible. Prayer for Omini, was it? No, and it, it barely stuck to the good parts of the book. It was only like 
the first third of the book? Because they stayed kids the whole time, oh, weren't yeah. they? I was just, I don't know. I was so frustrated. Like, the book, uh, you got to read the book. I, I, I do mix them up because I've read the book. We were in a book club. It was yeah. your suggestion. Yeah. I've read the book. And then when we were discussing the book, yeah. we got together and we watched the movie. So I watched the movie directly, like, the day after I finished the book. So they are really linked in my head, like... Because they, they were both there at the same time. I'm having trouble distinguishing between them right now. Oh, that's sad for you. It is. And the armadillo with no arms was on the cover. It was a huge... Yeah. It wasn't in the movie at all, was it? I can't even remember. I don't think but it was I mean, in there at that, all. That was... That was... Oh, the motifs. Oh, so many motifs. Oh, it was so good. Was it? It was. You don't argue with that. You know it was good. Yeah. It was good. Nah. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the author of Alligator and February, Lisa Moore. Lisa Moore, have you ever read anything that made you think differently about the concept of fiction? Mm, I'm sure every book I've read has done that to me. Um, it, if I followed it through, if I finished it particularly... Um, I think that Virginia Woolf really made me think about the concept of fiction in a very different way. She really writes from stream of consciousness. And so we uh, see the thoughts of her characters as they happen in real time. Uh, we feel what they feel, the fluttering of emotion and, and mood. And there's an immediacy in that fiction that made me realize that there's a different way to know characters. We can know them from the inside. Um, and and that was incredibly exciting to me when I happened upon her books. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Aaron Vance, editor-in-chief of Engine Books and the editor of the From the Rock anthology series. Uh, have you ever read anything that makes you think differently about the process of fiction, that makes you think differently about fiction in general? For me, it's Life of Pi, for instance. Oh, uh, I think the first, I'm going to say her name wrong because I always do, Maggie Steifata, um, her first book was Urban Fantasy for me. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you could do Urban Fantasy. Oh, okay. Um, was the actual title of it Urban Fantasy? No, it was the first one of hers I read is called Shiver and it's werewolves. Right. I love her books because it's all very realistic. Like everyone has cell phones, everyone has cars, and they're all older teenagers or like college -y. so I guess older teenagers no one's younger than like 16 and but then there's some element of magic some fantastical element in it but it they weave it into their world they don't so they'll still be driving cars while trying to figure out why there's like a giant like minotaur or something chasing them that's not quite how it is in one of her yeah. stories but it's and I didn't realize that you could merge things because every fantasy I'd ever read before was some other world. Sword and sorcery. Yeah. Yeah. Or Redwall, which isn't quite sword and sorcery. That's medieval. That's animal medieval. Sword and sorcery meets animal farm. Yeah. Which I is fun. I love Redwall. Redwall is fun, but that is that is interesting. Yeah. So that was the first one that made you... Go, oh, well, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, like there were... every All the genres had a nice little fence around them for you before then. And then mm -hmm. they went, no, no, bloop. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Morgan Murray, author. Currently, he has the book Dirty Birds with Breakwater Books. Uh, Morgan Murray, have you ever read anything that made you think differently about fiction, about the concept of fiction in and of itself? Um, yes. Uh, lots of stuff. One of the, one of my favorite books is Breakfast of Champions by uh, Vonnegut. Okay. Um, and Vonnegut just doesn't care about the rules. Um, and so I really admired that. And, um, I'm a big fan of, you'll see when, when you read Dirty Birds that I'm, not always uh, gentle to poets, um, and some poets have it coming. But I'm I really like it when poets write novels for some reason. Yeah. Um, and I went through a big Bukowski phase. Like I think every dude does <laughs> in his early twenties, um, where I found his novels just fascinating. Just the way 
he would use language and the way he would write, um, you know, being a poet. And so a lot of that um, really, you know, changed my perspective on what writing could be. And another, and also nonfiction has changed my mind about that too. Um, Will Ferguson, who gave me a really great blurb. He did. Um, and there's an amazing story behind that. Um, do you want to hear it? Sure. So uh, this kind of answers the question too. Um, I've always liked writing way back to when I was a little kid and I would, you know, would write a lot and, um, you know, won essay contests and stuff growing up in elementary school and all this stuff. Uh, but then I think like I was telling you in, in the other podcast, when I moved out of, moved off the farm to the big city, to Calgary, nine uh, eleven happened and the culture shock of moving to a big city from a little tiny farm happened and all this stuff. And so I was kind of in the dumps for a long time trying to figure out what the heck I was doing with my life. And I was, uh, had an undeclared major and all this stuff. And I read Wilton Ferguson's book, Why I Hate Canadians. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, which is hilarious. And it's just him, you know, bragging on Canada. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and I thought it was the funniest thing ever. And I love that book so much. And it's like, he's a smart ass. I could get be a smart ass and write, and it would be funny, maybe. And I don't know. I'm not nearly as good as him. Um, but it really inspired me to, you know, find a voice that's yours and write with it and uh, work at it. And so a couple of years later, he was doing a reading in Calgary. One, he had another book coming out. I can't remember which one. Um, so I took my dog-eared copy of uh, Why I Hate Canadians, and I was, like, clutching it to my chest, and I stood in line to talk to him, and I was so nervous and shaking, and I finally get up to him, and I'm stammering, and I'm like, oh, you, you inspired me. I my major is now Canadian studies and I want to be a writer when I grow up because of this book. And he was like, Oh, that's so nice to hear. Um, and so he wrote his email address in the book when he signed it. He said, if you ever write anything, let me know. I'd love to read it. And so fast forward 15 years or 17 years or whatever it was <laughs> to last fall. Um, I found the book and his email address. And so I emailed him I was like, what the heck he said. So I, and I asked him for a blurb and he, uh, said sure and he did and it was an amazing blurb and uh it was hilarious and i told him you should stop giving your email address but he's just like the most gracious nicest human so for um, god's sake learn and learn that's a wonderful story learn from that and pay it forward because that we need absolutely. more people that are willing to give blurbs you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure yeah absolutely wonderful that is a great story and that that does answer the question that's excellent Thank you very much. Next up, we have Ali House, author of the Segment Delta Archives series, as well as a frequent contributor to the From the Rock collection of anthologies. Uh, Ali House, have you ever read anything that made you feel differently about fiction or think differently about fiction? Um, well, I know that when I read the book Every Heart a Doorway, it kind of got me thinking about the way that we represent people in fiction and just ways to include everyone so that they're not all just one cookie cutter type of character. So we can have different viewpoints. We can have people with different feelings. We can have more representation. Okay. That's yeah, it got me thinking about that. <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Nicole Little. Nicole Little is an acclaimed short story author who has been featured in more than a half dozen titles just in the last year. She has been featured in Kitsora, the autobiography, best-selling dystopia from The Rock, Flights from The Rock, Monsters, Beyond, and Apocalypse, Apocalypse, 
eerie Christmas, love, and bad romance. It's just a plethora of short story material. Currently, she is working on The Lotus Fountain, which is going to be one of the books included in, or novellas included in a big project from Engine Books that we can talk about now called Slipstreamers, which is a multi-author novella series, which to release one book, one novella, a month. Thank you for joining us, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Uh, Nicole Little, have you read ever read anything that made you think differently about fiction in general, like the concept of fiction? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I read a lot, um, and I try to read a little bit of everything because I think that sort of. You know, I like to be well-read, try different things. Yeah. Um, I don't know that anything specifically has ever changed the way I thought about writing. I do know that I'm heavily influenced sometimes by... Not about uh, writing, about fiction. Hmm. Like, for me, it's Life of Pi. Like, I had, like, I had a genuinely transcendent experience at the end of Life of Pi. Like, the... Not the gut punch, but the moral of the gut punch, of the, the shock ending. I was like, oh my god. And it actually made me question the way I looked at the world. That kind okay. of, like, yeah. Um, I remember when I was... I had this summer job when I was 17. I worked in, a, in like, a, a museum. And okay. at the time, tourism wasn't that big at home. So we did not get a lot of visitors. And so I would always read while I was um, working, I suppose. It was a great summer. I got paid to read. Yeah. Um, So I spent a lot of time at the library, and I started reading a lot of different things. Like um, I started getting into Stephen King and Dean Coons and just like that sort of genre and it really opened my eyes to, I guess, different worlds. And um, I guess knowing that, because when I was younger, I read a lot of romance, because that's what my grandmother used to read, so she used to always give the books to me. Sure. So reading this, um, I guess, like horror and fantasy and thriller and stuff really opened my eyes to... Um, different sorts of fiction, different sorts of writing, and different places that you could go on, and that, you know, your imagination was as broad as you wanted it to be. Oh, yeah. The idea that anything can happen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of really good... um, Weirdly, uh, like, when it comes to, like, important books, I always point to, like, Life of Pi or Flowers for Algernon or something like that. But there's another book that really, like, blew me away like that. And that, like, what, you you can do this? And that was uh, the last couple books of the Stephen King series, The Dark Tower. Okay, yeah. Have you ever read the whole series? I haven't read the whole series, no. That's one of the ones I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten around to yet. So, spoilers, but... So, the series is about... Th- time and all universes collapsing in on themselves okay so by the end all universes are collapsing in on themselves and it's a popular thing in marvel comics and dc comics and also in stephen king i don't know if that's where he got it from that basically every fictional story you've ever read including the ones you've written just take place in alternate universes. And, like, you are the conduit for this other universe's stories, and that's where they come from. That's trippy. I know that's trippy, and it's bizarre. (laughs) Uh, So, at the end of the Dark Tower series, uh, he got permission from a bunch of different authors to use their material, because all universes are caving in on each other, so why wouldn't there be stuff from non-Stephen King books? So the bad guys, like, got a bunch of golden sneetches from Harry Potter and, <laughs> like, attached bombs to them and sent them across the battlefield. Uh, they crazy. all show up wearing Doctor Doom armor from Marvel Comics. Like, that kind of crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of blew me away with the, like, what, you can do this? Yes, exactly. Like, like just, like, you can write anything you want, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Like, you're, you know? Yeah. 
Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next up, we have Peter Foote, owner of Fiction First Used Books, the founder of the Genre Writers of Atlantic Canada page, and frequent contributor to the From the Rock anthology. Uh, have you ever read anything that makes you think differently about fiction as a concept? Wow, you're right. That is a tough one. <laughs> that is a heady question. Yeah. Thanks for springing it on me. <laughs> as, I babble, as I babble trying to think of a, a good example, um, I guess I do have a bit of an answer for you. Not, not nearly as in-depth as yours, but... Um, I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan as well, okay. and for me, uh, Sherlock Holmes is the. Some authors have tried to create um, different versions of, of him in different um, situations. Um, my mother, of all people, gave me a book written by Laurie R. King called *The Beekeeper's Apprentice*, and it is the story of uh, a retired Sherlock Holmes who meets a 20-something, or no, even younger than that, um, young lady on uh, in uh, England, and actually they become a partnership and marry. And for me, Sherlock Holmes, up until that point, was a character in my head, and he was set in stone. But this author was able to portray, uh, portray that relationship and how it grew actually shifted and it really opened my eyes, allowing me to see that a character that I saw in one way and been a huge part of my life um, actually could grow in a reasonable and intellectual, intellectually stimulating way. And um, that really has stuck with me. And it's a, one of those books that, oh, every 18 months that I'll pick up and reread, even though I know how, how it ends. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Matthew Daniels, author of the upcoming novel Diary of Knives, as well as the author of many pieces of international short fiction. Matthew Daniels, have you ever read anything that made you feel differently or think differently about the concept of fiction? The concept of fiction? Um, wow. Uh, what would I have read? I would even really do that. Uh, oh, uh, I know I'm going for that one. The Devil in the White City. I've never heard uh, of this. Explain it. I've I've never. I don't recall the author off the top of my head, but sure. um, it is creative nonfiction. This is my introduction to that particular sliver of writing, and the difference between cre like nonfiction and fiction. You've got this little sliver of creative nonfiction that's kind of sitting between them, where the core of the story is a real thing that happened You're You're following the story of, I don't know, Jack the Ripper or, um, perhaps someone more positive, um, Amelia Earhart, maybe. Sure. And, uh, and everybody knows from the history books, this person went here to here to here and they did this and this and this and that sort of thing. But, uh, with the creative nonfiction in a book like the devil in the white city, we've got our historical facts, but we don't actually have the, any like transcripts of every conversation that this person had. So you know that there's a period of like four months where this person was studying such and such, and they made a friend in this person. Uh, the movie uh, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe yes. is a good example of this kind of stuff, where the conversations that uh, Nash, I believe it was, was the guy's name, the mathematician that, that Crowe was playing, um, Nash was... Uh, you know, he had these friends, or this friend who turned out to be imaginary, but we see these conversations with his imaginary friend. We see him working out these uh, economic math things that he does, which they, which he uses in a bar as describing how dudes should approach the ladies yeah. um, and that sort of thing. Uh, that's a good example of like, because we know that Nash is a real person. We know that these were real accomplishments he made. We know he was he visited these bars and stuff because they were on or near campus, and he was at the university. And he was a, a person, and therefore interacted with people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the actual specific conversations and the actual specific relationships probably didn't go exactly that way. No, probably not. <laughs> probably not. No, right? The author's filling in those gaps. So The Devil in the White City is the big book that comes to mind for me as one of, as one of my big experiences for that, where uh, fiction takes a different angle there. 
than it would in, say, The Lord of the Rings, where I guarantee you, you've never met Frodo. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And no one's going to find Rivendell, no matter how far you look. <laughs> you say that as someone who's looked a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.